Isn't NPM unsafe? There are a million who know what's in my module directory. It took 30 minutes just to delete dependencies that depend on dependencies a million times over. This NPM ecosystem is a giant security vulnerability. We've all traded security for convenience. Every project that uses NPM is basically a security problem too. Like set up a basic project and you already have a billion dependencies and nobody knows what they do. <sighs> Guess that we're talking about NPM today. For those who don't know what's going on, NPM is not unsafe at the moment. There's no big security thing that just happened with NPM. What did happen is an exploit with a service called Polyfill.io. If you're not caught up on that, you should go check out my video, maybe check out Low Levels, or I guess Prime put one out too. The thing with Polyfill was about CDNs. If you're not familiar, there's a bunch of different ways to bundle and include your JavaScript inside of your websites. If I go to, let's say, my Twitch chat, where I'm live right now, by the way, I stream live on Twitch every Wednesday. For those who don't know, that's where I film most of my videos. So if you go to a website like Twitch or any other website on the internet, you can look at the script tags. These are the actual JavaScript the page loads in order for it to work and behave as you would expect. If you go to a more traditional site like my T3 homepage, we search for script tags in here, you'll see there is basically none. We just have this one minimal Astro script that is used for making the page transitions work really nice. Apparently I have one more down here. Oh yeah, the Astro module. You'll notice something different about this one though. See how it starts with a slash? That's because this is on this domain. The other ones here you'll see have URLs associated with them, which in this case do happen to be the same domain, like t3.gg, that is this page, so that's fine. Actually, I know what this one is. That's my um, script for uh, plausible. So that's what that one is, figure that out. But these ones that are included by Astro when I actually bundle the code, these are part of my actual deployment. So my deployment has HTML files, CSS files, and JS files. All of the JS being loaded on this page comes from me. This is all stuff being served on my service. The polyfill thing was sketchy because not everybody had things set up that way. Back in the day, people were scared of hosting their own JavaScript files or they saw others weren't, so they didn't feel like bothering themselves. So what we would do is we would embed script tags from other sites. If I scroll, hopefully not too far. When I did my video, I actually noticed that Hulu was an example of doing this wrong. So Hulu's obviously at hulu.com. If we look at all of these link tags, these are all referencing their deployment with the slash at the start. But up here, cdn.polyfill.io, that is not Hulu's domain. They don't own polyfill.io, but they're loading JavaScript from it on their site. That's what's scary here. They are letting another place deliver JavaScript to their users in their browsers on their websites. So what the heck does this have to do with NPM? This is the way we used to include other people's JavaScript in our sites. If you wanted to add the Bootstrap JS library, you could include it like this. If you wanted to include it jQuery on your site, you could include it like this. The jQuery CDN's a thing of legends nowadays. Another question I saw a lot of people asking, I don't even know if this fits in this video, uh, just saw it again, would the SHA integrity attribute solve this? For those that don't know, you could mark in the JavaScript code or in the HTML code and say, hey, this is the hash we expect for this file. So we expect this specific file to be the one that comes down when you go to this URL. The thing about polyfill.io is that it actually used the headers from the browser to determine which file they send to you. So if you're on Internet Explorer 7, you get a different file from the same URL than you would get if you're on a modern version of Chrome. Because of that, they can't use the integrity checks because the file will be different for every user, potentially. And that's why this one was particularly sketchy. But let's be real, nobody's doing those checks anyways. So. Why is everybody asking me about NPM and complaining about NPM when this is going on? I think the reason is a fundamental misunderstanding of how modern bundlers work. So, you know what? Let's spin up a project quick so I can show what I'm talking about here. So for this demo, I'm just using Vite. It's still using NPM, but Vite is the bundler. Remember that word, bundler. It's very important here for those who don't seem to understand it. The bundler is what takes these packages that we have installed. In this case, we have React and React DOM and then a bunch of dev dependencies, also a thing we'll talk about in a bit. So React and React DOM are included when we make the site. So if I was to npm run build, and then npm run preview. So once you bundle this, if I open here, it's probably going and grabbing that package from some CDN, right? Nope. It's referencing a local asset, these index.js files that are weirdly hashed and named. Well, the JS and the CS file. So what's going on in these files? We can take a look. If I go to sources, we can open this file. Assets, here's our JS file. Minified React error at license React DOM production. Oh, huh. What's going on here is it created a JS file 
just one JS file. We could even look at it. If we go to our terminal, I can open, or we can even look at it in VS Code, honestly. Go to dist, go in here, assets, index.js. This is the bundle for our site. All of the code we have, as well as all of the code for the packages we use, has been included in this file. So we're not going to some third party source every time somebody is trying to access our website. It's all provided by us when we use NPM. There's a lot more subtlety here that we'll get into, but I wanted to make sure we start with this point because people seem to fundamentally not understand it. When you use modern build tools and you use something like NPM, you're not using NPM to send the file to users. You're using NPM to download the file yourself before you bundle it for your users. But if you're using NPM, you're almost certainly using it to host your own assets in your site like we're doing here because NPM was originally built just to be for the server side stuff. It was built as a package manager for Node. It's not how your users get your packages unless you're building dev tools and your users are developers. If you have a person going to your website, NPM is not involved. The package has to already have been downloaded and put in a format for the user. The reason we have things like Webpack and like bundlers is because the format that made these work great for Node didn't work at all for the web. And the introduction of Webpack was to package your Node project in a way that you could send it to your users through the browser. That's a huge part of how the web has evolved to the point that it's evolved today. And just to prove how this works, make it a little clearer, I'm gonna go put some random text in here. Like let's say, uh, don't forget to sub. And now that I've saved that, we can go back here. We have to rebuild. Oh, it's mad because we have these imports that we're not using. It's nice they have good lint rules now. Kill all of that npm run preview and now if i load this back up we see the don't forget to sub and if i go into that bundle this index.js file command f don't forget to sub and look at that it's right in here we have the js fragment children don't forget to sub this is how everything like jsx to all the other stuff that we're writing gets compiled out no typescript anymore because the code we write the code we install is different from the code we ship to our users so why are people so confused it seems like they think these packages are coming from an unsafe source. And there are ways it can be unsafe. Like let's say React's NPM package gets hijacked by some bad actor and they push some sketchy stuff. This has happened before. We've seen a lot of projects get either get hijacked and ship malware via NPM or the actual maintainer goes mad and does the same thing. That sounds like an absolute disaster. And I'm not going to pretend it's not potentially problematic. It absolutely is in the same way it is in any ecosystem where you install packages. But there's a piece people seem to miss. A lot of people seem to miss. Even other fellow creators like James Quick seem to miss. Let me know in the comments if you vibe with this tweet because it, it hurts me deeply, but it seems to be a pretty common sentiment. I still don't know what the package lock JSON file is used for. Uh, so in case you don't know and are curious, whenever you use NPM or any similarly competent tool, there's a thing called the package lock. The package lock specifies which exact version of things are going to be used by your code base. So here we see React is pinned to 18.3.1. If I npm install, it will always install this version. So if they were to push a version 19 that was sketchy, it doesn't matter because I'm pinned to 18.3.1. If somebody was to go freshly install npm install React at latest, they would be hit with the new sketchy version, but then you can put out a functional fixed one right after when they get unhijacked. And even if you leave the malware version up on npm, let's say theoretically React 19.0.0 was malware, 1901 could fix it, and anybody who has 1900 pinned is broken, but everybody NPM installing from that point forward is going to get the right safe version. So the only potential victim in a hijacking scenario is somebody who is installing latest at the time where that exploit is the latest version. For basically anything else, you're safe. There is one more exception, and please, please, I have videos on why to not do this. Don't do this. Also, don't do this. Don't tag something that isn't a specific version, like, please don't do that. Just put a version in. If I delete these and I quickly uh, npm install, now they're gone. So if I go to the package lock, React's not in here anymore. If I reinstall, it's not going to pin latest or some shit. It just puts the exact same code back. When you install NP or when you install something with npm, it does the right thing. We're good here. <laughs> The only thing that you could potentially have concerns about is not knowing who's actually controlling one of your sub packages. As one of the commenters on Low Level's video so eloquently put it, 
Seriously, React takes many minutes to download just because all of the random dependencies and their dependencies and their dependencies dependencies. It's dependency diary, and I don't think anyone has it as bad as JavaScript. I think it's just because of the batteries not included nature of Node. You need to find little modules to do everything, and this causes dependency hell for the simplest libraries. It's hard for me to not go in the fact that they're talking about Node and React like they're somehow even kind of linked, which is really funny. People in chat are already saying something even funnier, which is this guy's never dealt with Android apps or iOS apps. Like, God, the state of cargo is hilarious. The state of things like the pod ecosystem on iOS are hilarious. Like package management always sucks. But that's not why this one's so funny to me. This one's funny to me. Well, I'll show you because the problem's real. Look at how many dependencies React has. This is dependency graph. It shows every dependency and its subdependencies. And God, React has three whole dependencies. That's terrifying. How can we ever cope with that? Also, there's React DOM, which adds a whole fourth one. The scheduler, four kilobytes. Oh my God, how, how are we continuing to use React when it's in this insane bloated state with a whole five kilobytes of third-party packages? How will we ever survive? What they might be thinking of are things like React Native or Next. Next has a few more. Still not many more, but a few more. I wanna talk about these few more though because a bunch of them don't actually ship to the user. This is a thing I wanted to emphasize, the difference between dependencies and dev dependencies. Dev dependencies never get sent to your users at all. These are packages that run on your machine. TypeScript doesn't go to your users. ESLint plugins don't go to your users. None of these things are included in the bundle that gets created when you run Webpack or Vite or ESBuild or RSPack now or any of those things. Dev dependencies aren't included. If I search ESLint in here, nothing comes up because ESLint isn't included in the final bundle. Dev dependencies are not a risk to your users unless there's some dev dep that is so insane that it hijacks your machine and takes over how it's actually building the bundles. But once the bundle has been built, there is no risk. This is why the old method, the way we used to do things where we use random CDNs for all of our JavaScript stuff, that was terrible. And to think this is a new problem and this is just how we do things now and it's terrible and the old way was great is a fundamental misunderstanding both of how it worked before and how it works now. The idea that the vast majority of modern web applications are bundling the vast majority of their dependencies themselves is awesome. And I'm gonna channel an unexpected source here. We're gonna go to Mitchell Hashimoto. If you don't know him, he's the creator of HashiCorp and one of the people who made Terraform possible. So obviously we're not in the same side of this world, but he made a really interesting point here. Unpopular opinion. You should copy, fork, or DIY your dependencies for everything but the most complicated or sensitive functionality. Things like the GUI, the crypto, module, networking, etc. Blindly depending on trivial functionality or having a deep dependency tree causes more problems than it solves. On one hand, I actually kind of agree here. If you don't own the packages, especially, if those are being sourced for each user on every request, that's terrifying. But another way to think of this is that it's kind of what we're already doing. When we install a package, that's not a binary being included that's all obfuscated and impossible for us to read. That's source code being thrown in our node modules. We can go in our node modules, we can open up ESLint, and we can see the code that it put on our machine. And mind you, this is still the code that's just on our machine. We can go through and read it all. It's just there. Because again, these tools are used to get code from NPM's verified servers that are signed and you'll always get the same thing. If you ask NPM for a specific version of a package, you will always get that exact same file every time. That means you're just transferring the file to your machine, which is effectively copying it. It's not literally copying it into your code base. And if you can reasonably do that, that's a totally fine idea. But the fact that all of these dependencies are verified via a lock file, that lock file also hashes to make sure each of these modules matches a specific integrity check. And this is all committed to your code base. So even if theoretically somebody stole NPM itself and replaced all of these packages with malware, it's just gonna fail the integrity checks. It's actually very safe. It's so confusing to me why people think NPM is this massive risk just like a CDN is. But all it takes for any CDN-based web app to get pwned is one of the domains you're sourcing data from getting pwned, which is why the polyfill thing happened in the first place. The polyfill supply chain attack is one of the things that is prevented by using an NPM-based workflow and having decent bundlers in your tools. If you're using bundlers, you don't have this problem. The reason that this thing escaped and there were so many people with this is because their bundlers were bundling 
for old browsers and new browsers, but the bundler was only built to do things right in the new browser. So they would include this third-party script. They would just go throw it in the HTML to quickly make sure the old browsers that don't have these new behaviors are handled. But as soon as you include that URL, you're screwed. The reason this whole exploit happened is because the domain people were loading their JS from got compromised. The domain people are loading JS from using modern tools is your own domain. So the only way using NPM will get your users compromised is if you install a package that is compromised in the small window where that compromise exists, and now it's in your package lock, and now you're distributing that on your own service, or more likely, your own domain and service gets compromised. That's the risk here. You're creating a binary, a bundle, that is entirely in your code base, that's entirely in your space. Once a user is loading your page, they're loading your JavaScript. You might have gotten that JavaScript from other places, but now it's an artifact that exists, that has commits that prove it, that has verification steps to make sure it passes integrity checks. A lot of the things I saw people saying, and a lot of the concerns I saw people having around this are just not how these problems work. Pin a version in your package JSON, install the package, or just install the package in the first place and it'll do the right thing anyways. You're good to go. If we were having this conversation before package locks existed, this would be a very different conversation. We've had package locks in NPM since 2017. This is a seven year old solution. And even before then, Yarn introduced the Yarn lock like way earlier. So we've had these for a while. It's just not a problem. <laughs> I wanna clarify the functional difference between depths and dev depths in Node. The difference, uh, dependencies are included, dev depths are not. I guess for Node, it's a little more complex because there is barely a difference when you're just in the node world. But when you're in the NPM and uh, specifically when you're in the bundling world, the difference matters a lot more. So to just clarify one last time, the only reason NPM could be a security issue is if a package you already depend on but don't have locked to a specific version is compromised and you either install the latest version or happen to set up a new project without a lock file and install the newest version then. And that's kind of it. The only reason you would think this is because you don't know what a package lock is, or you started using NPM before they were a thing, or you don't understand what a CDN is or how it works. I hate to be harsh about this one, but the comment came up enough and did well enough that it seemed like a lot of you needed a quick lesson on how these things work. So uh, there you go. Until next time, peace.